Good morning. My name is Julian LaFortune, and I'm a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. Welcome to our virtual program today, featuring the findings from PPIC's latest report, examining the reach of targeted school funding. The report, technical appendices, policy brief, as well as the slides for today's presentation are all available on our website at ppic.org. This research and event are supported with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Capsnell Foundation, and the Stewart Foundation. We'd like to thank them for their support. For today's virtual briefing, I'll present the main findings from our report and answer some audience questions. If you have a question, please send it along with your name and organization to the email address on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And as a final reminder, PPIC is a public charity and does not take or support positions on any ballot measure legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. And now on to the presentation. So today I'm talking about our most recent report examining how school funding is targeted under LCFF, and this is joint work with Joey Herrera and New Gao. And just to start off with a little bit of a background and motivation for what we're looking at. So about 10 years ago, uh, California implemented the Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF, which fundamentally shifted school finance in the state. And there's kind of two main things that LCFF did. And one, it increased funding for high need students and high need students under the formula are defined as those who are either low income, English learner or foster youth. And this is through what's sometimes referred to as a weighted funding formula. So essentially districts with more or higher shares of high need students get more funding under the formula. Um, and this funding is through what are called supplemental and concentration grants. And so I'll refer to supplemental and concentration grants um, or s &C dollars a few times late, you know, in this presentation. And then the second thing, and this isn't as much of a focus of the presentation and our work today, um, but is still an important aspect of LCFF nonetheless, is that it simplified the funding formula quite significantly, resulting in greater flexibility. And this was primarily done through less reliance on restricted funding items um, or categoricals as they're commonly referred to. And so a little bit of context on what funding looks like for a typical district under LCFF. And so here, uh, this shows kind of the LCFF funding formula um, for a district that has about the grade distribution uh, of the, you know, the statewide average. It varies a little bit by grade, um, but kind of on average, it's about $10,000 um, per student that's allocated under the base grant. Um, and then as a district has a, sh you know, higher share of high need students, as the number of high need students in the district increases, they get, they get supplemental dollars. Um, that's kind of the shaded area just above the base grant. And then above 55% high need, they get concentration dollars. And these concentration dollars increase and kind of create this kink or this hockey stick type feature um, to the LCFF funding. And you can see based on the graph that it results in big differences um, in the funding levels that go to districts that have very high shares of high need students, perhaps 80, 90, or 100% high need. And those kind of rated the concentration grant threshold about 55 or 60% high need. And, and, and today, um, in per student dollars, the difference between a district that's just kind of rate, you know, marginally at the concentration threshold um, versus one that's 100% high need is, is almost $4,000 per student. So it's quite significant. Um, and, you know, the other kind of important thing to know about LCFF is not only is this funding kind of targeted more predominantly or most predominantly to these very high need districts, um, but it also came about in a time period when funding increased broadly across all school districts of different levels of need. And so here this shows the increase over the first decade of LCFF in per student dollars for districts at the low end of need, zero to 30 percent high need, all the way on the left, um, to those all the way on the right that are 80 percent or more high need. Um, the orange bar shows total spending. Uh, the blue bar shows current spending, that is spending, you know, total spending, taking out capital expenditures, debt service, um, and a few other things that aren't kind of current expenditures on, on current K through 12 or TK through 12 students. And the, kind of the main, you know, thing that I want to point out from this figure is not only were there, you know, large increases across districts, but there were relatively larger increases in those districts that got concentration funds above 55% high need, and really in those 80% uh, and above high need districts. And so if we just kind of compare, you know, the lower need districts below the concentration threshold to those that are 55 to 80, it's a relative increase of about $1,000 more over this time period, but it's a relative increase 
of almost four to five thousand dollars more for those 80 percent high need districts. And so that's where really a lot of the funding formula dollars um, or the biggest impact, at least on the finances of districts, has accrued under LCFF. And so in this report, we examine two research questions. Um, and we'll start off by talking about, well, what is just the impact of these additional dollars on high need districts um, in terms of their student test score outcomes? And here, this is essentially measuring the impact um, where dollars land. So where the districts who have seen the biggest increases in funding, what's the impact on their student test score outcomes? And then second, and we'll dig into this a little bit more deeply, um, well, how is funding distributed within districts? Uh, funding is going to these districts. Are they spending it in proportion uh, on high need students or high need school sites in proportion to how these students or school sites generate funds? Um, and we'll look at this in a couple of different ways and provide some new evidence on that front. And so on the test score part, um, you know, just to start off, the, you know, to kind of motivate what we find um, or how we look at what we find, uh, the formula has this kink at the 55% concentration threshold, which enables us to kind of use the fact that there's a discontinuous relationship to really look at, okay, well, what is the impact of concentration grant funding? Um, we have this shape to the funding formula. Do we see a similar shape emerge when we look at the relationship between, you know, share high need and also student test scores? Um, and just to kind of preview the findings there, there's more details on how we actually implement this in the report. Uh, but we, we see large gains in test scores emerge post LCFF, um, and they actually persist in the, in the most recent year of data post COVID that we have for test scores in 21, 22. And to put the magnitude in some context, if we look at the very high end of these districts that received you know, a lot of additional funding under LCFF, so say take districts that are 95% high need, we see that you know, kind of our estimates imply that you know, proficiency rates um, in math and English on average increased roughly about 13 percentage points due to the concentration grant funding. Um, and that has come at a significant cost as well. Um, so we also estimate you know, over the first nine years of LCFF, that's been about you know, an investment of about $16,000 per student um, in those districts due to the concentration grant um, and supplemental funding increases in those 95% you know, districts. And this, I'll just note, is kind of consistent um, with both path, past research we've done at PPIC a couple of years ago and more recent research you know, out by Rucker Johnson looking uh, using CalPADS data statewide. So the, the question then becomes, okay, we have large increases in outcomes, uh, you know, where these dollars are heavily in, you know, targeted to students um, in these highest need districts. Um, but we haven't perhaps seen the movement on, say, achievement gap statewide um, or large increases in proficiency that we might expect. And so, you know, what kind of get, you know, what gives, what's the, the reason for this potential discrepancy or is that a discrepancy at all? Um, and the point that we, you know, try to make in this report is that, you know, actually the way that funding is targeted um, can maybe dilute or attenuate the impact of LCFF on gaps, at least if we're measuring them based on student characteristics. And why is that? Well, the increases are really largely targeted to those that are in the highest need districts. Um, largest increases in funding at 80, 90 percent, you know, close to 100 percent high need. Um, but that may not, you know, that's not how we're always me often measuring gaps. Sometimes we're measuring gaps based on student, you know, whether a student is high need or low income or not, um, and not really comparing those lowest versus the highest need districts. And when we do that, we actually kind of get different answers. The second point that I'll make is that you know, concentration dollars are based on district and not school shares high need. And so just as an example, and we kind of delve into this more in the report, if we look at the supplemental and concentration grants that uh, funding that's generated by a school site that say 100% high need, that actually varies significantly based on the district they're in, anywhere from, you know, about a thousand to four thousand dollars in the most recent year of data we have. So what does that mean? Essentially, you know, high need students in schools, even at these very high concentration school sites, um, are worth more or less in some districts based on the characteristics of the other students in the district. A couple more statistics on this point that I think just to kind of reinforce, uh, you know, why we might expect these differences. Um, well, overall, 81% of high need students are in these concentration districts that get additional funds. Um, but less than half, about 44%, are in those 80% or more high need districts that really are getting the bulk of additional funds under LCFF. And at the same time, almost half of the state's non-high need students are actually in concentration districts. And so what that means in, is in the absence of any kind of you know, targeting within districts, we're going to expect that the impact on any sort of student level gap we measure is going to be smaller than a district level gap we measure. Um, and that'll depend on targeting, 
And one way that we, we show this in the report is under some you know, a hypothetical scenario. And so suppose that we give about $2,000 per high need student. This is very similar to kind of how the supplemental grant works. Um, the impact of that on high need students depends on, on targeting. And so if we give 2000 per high need student, districts fully target those to the students and school sites you know, that are high need, then we end up with $2,000 for high need students. That's what's shown on the left. Um, if districts target, say, half of that funding and then spend the other half equally, uh, then it's close to 2000 for high need, but non-high need students actually get a bump of about $500. Uh, if it's equal, actually, then both high need and non-high need students are getting a lot of additional funding if there's just purely equal targeting within the district. And then the relative gap for high need students is actually not very large, uh, less than about $500. Um, and then if it's actually somewhat regressive, say, you know, districts target the funding you know, more, you know, they target more of that funding to non-high need students, um, about half, you know, more to non-high need students and half of it equally, um, then we actually can get a case where, you know, even though we're targeting high need students with a statewide policy, when we give it to districts, if districts kind of reverse that targeting, it may benefit non-high need students more. And so these are all hypotheticals, uh, just to show that the impact, uh, you know, of the formula really matters how these dollars are targeted within districts. And so how do we analyze this? Well, we do this in two ways. And so first, we rely on local control and accountability plans. Um, and these are district spending plans or district plans that include a lot of information about how dollars are spent and how the strategies you know, the district is taking to address you know, various uh, needs in their district unfold. Um, and we extract spending plans um, from about 700 districts that cover 81% of the statewide student enrollment in 2021-22. And we're really interested in what we kind of call a metric of proportionality. And so that basically the metric that we use is to compare the planned spending out of LCFF funding that districts have uh, that they specify as for high need student groups, so any high need student group. Um, and then we compare that to the amount of funding that they actually receive. So basically, what do you plan on your LCAP or what does a district plan and how does that compare to the actual funding that they receive for high need students? So is it proportional, um, more, you know, more than proportional, less than proportional? And we'll show some figures on that. And then second, we also rely on school level spending data. Um, and so we exclude federal dollars from these school site level spending that we have. And we kind of compare, okay, if a site generates a dollar more in, in supplemental and concentration funding due to its student population, do we see a high $1 more in higher spending uh, at those school sites compared to other school sites in the same district that generate less funding? And what we find when we look at LCAPs is that most districts actually report less spending for high need students um, than the supplemental and concentration dollars they get that the high need students generate for the district. And so just overall, um, when we look at overall spending on an LCAP, about 28% of LCFF spending on LCAPs goes towards any high need student groups. The majority of, of spending that's reported on LCAPs actually gets targeted or listed at least as being targeted for all students. Um, but when we look specifically at the funding that's targeted for these high need students, so that 28% of all the funding, and then we compare it district by district to what they get in supplemental and concentration funding, we see that about 60%, 59% um, actually report less funding, uh, the less, sorry, less spending on high need students than the funding that they receive. This is a little bit lower in concentration districts. So that is to say, you know, concentration districts spend more evenly across students rather than targeting as explicitly to high need students. Um, and then we also actually find that there's, you know, a minority, but a substantial number of districts, about one quarter of districts, that actually spend more on high need students than they, you know, or report spending more on high need students than they get in supplemental and concentration dollars. And so in a sense, they're spending more, say, progressively than the formula might indicate. Um, so there's a lot of heterogeneity there. And when we turn to the school level spending data, we see a similar pattern. You know, for $1 more in funding generated at a site, statewide, the average school site spends about 63 cents per dollar more on high, you know, high need school sites. Um, so that kind of indicates that there's partial targeting and that, you know, the other 37 cents is spent a little bit more equally across schools. Uh, but there's a lot of variation by district. And so most concentration districts are targeting, you know, similar to the LCAP analysis when we look at the school level spending data, they're targeting less than dollar per dollar. Um, you know, some spend kind of fit what looks to be fairly evenly with no targeting. Others spend, you know, more progressively than the formula implies. And we have a few example districts in the report that kind of show what this looks like in very large districts with a lot of schools where we think we have, you know, fairly reasonable estimates of what districts are doing. And the caveat I'll note here, and this isn't, you know, a caveat that's 
uh, specific to the school level targeting data um, and not the LCAP data is just that this excludes uh, funds that are centrally allocated. And so this may, you know, over or underestimate the extent of targeting, depending on how those central dollars, whether they're, you know, more or less targeted to high need students than the average student. And so I'll just conclude with a few um, policy implications and recommendations. And, you know, I think just to kind of highlight an initial, you know, the first finding that I presented, and that kind of builds on prior work that's been released on LCFF, um, we find that concentration dollars did improve test scores in both math and reading across grades. Um, but when, we want, when we're thinking about broadly, you know, how can we affect achievement gaps and really perhaps get greater movement there, um, if that is indeed the policy goal that we have, um, then we may want to consider ways to improve the targeting uh, or to have better targeting of LCFF towards high need students where they're located. So a lot of high need students in the state haven't necessarily seen, you know, equal fight, you know, equal, e have equally benefited from the financial changes under LCFF. Um, and, and kind of, you know, some of those changes may actually uh, allow the formula to better kind of attack the achievement gaps that we're so often concerned about. Um, but one thing that limits us is, at least as statewide analysts, is that there's not a lot of transparency um, about, you know, to understand where the supplemental and concentration dollars are going, you know, how much is spent, where is it spent, which students is it spent on, um, there just isn't kind of consistent financial reporting, you know, and LCAPs, as we've analyzed, provide perhaps one means to do this, although they're inconsistent and it requires a lot of effort to analyze. At the same time, for local stakeholders, they're often very long and complex documents. Um, and so we recommend, you know, perhaps a consideration to streamline these LCAPs in a way that could both, you know, it could be done in a way that both improves transparency um, on a fiscal side and better links you know, some of these spending, you know, spending plans and, and expenditure numbers to the other statewide fiscal reporting systems, while at the same time, you know, keeping district uh, needs in mind and trying to simplify the document for them so as to not create more reporting burdens. So I'll pause after that um, and just want to remind everyone, again, if you have questions to please, uh, you know, please submit them to PPIC event questions at gmail.com. And so I'll answer the first question. So we got a, a question from Sacramento, um, you know, how can we increase targeting without a return to categoricals? And I think this is a, you know, this is an important question. Um, part of the, you know, one way that we perhaps could increase targeting is by introducing greater accountability. Um, but, the, you know, accountability kind of pushes back against the, you know, one of the central tenets of LCFF that's been very popular as well, and that's increased flexibility for districts. So how do we balance, you know, accountability and flexibility, you know, I think that's a, a challenging ask. Um, but I think increasing the fiscal transparency and at least giving the tools for local stakeholders to then be, you know, have the information that then, you know, can better understand how dollars are targeted, where they're spent in ways that are actually consistently reported and agreed upon as being, you know, kind of a statewide standard that matches other data sets. I think that would be a great start. So we don't necessarily need to start with harsh measures of accountability, um, but greater transparency around how these dollars are flowing, I think, would allow people at both the state and regional and local level to really understand, um, well, you know, are our funds being targeted with the, you know, targeted within districts um, to the, you know, in, in the ways that are consistent with what we intend under the formula. And so the, the next question um, is, can you talk about how we, you know, LCFF targets to other important groups like English learners and foster youth? Um, and this is something that we, we analyzed uh, a little bit in the report, but didn't look at in, in as much detail um, as it deserves. Uh, you know, I think the, the kind of key, one thing that we found on, on LCAPs was that um, when districts report spending for high need student groups, they tend to report that it goes to, to all high need student groups. So the share uh, of LCFF spending that goes to any high need student group or to English learners or to low income students or to foster youth was actually very, very similar. Um, and, and that was just because most of these lines on the actual expenditure tables report an action and an item, and it tends to be targeted towards all high need student groups. So you know, to the extent that some of these resources are intended for low income students or a specific subpopulation, perhaps like homeless students, um, or are targeted specifically for services for foster youth or for services for English learners, um, you know, that's difficult to kind of tease that out, at least with the data that we have on LCAPs. And that's kind of one area, perhaps, that there could be greater transparency or at least perhaps, a, you know, some, uh, some efforts to try to get districts to decompose uh, and disaggregate some of that spending a bit more than, than it's reported currently. 
So the next question is, you know, should LCFF funds and concentration dollars be based on school uh, concentration instead of district need? Um, you know, and I highlighted in the presentation, and we show a figure that on this in the report that high high concentration schools, for example, schools that are very you know have very high shares of high need students, um, get different amounts of dollars or generate different you know levels of, of additional funding depending on what the you know the characteristics of their districts that they're located in. Um, and, and though you know most of these kind of high concentration schools are located in the concentration districts that get a lot of dollars, um, there are examples. Um, a minority, but there are certainly examples that, you know, many schools that have concentrated poverty um, that don't, you know, are in districts that don't get a lot of additional funding under LCFF. Um, and so, you know, finding a way to target those types of schools is important, um, but also I think there's a lot of, you know, there's from kind of a technical perspective, uh, you know, relying just on school level need, I think gives us some pause because we don't want to create an incentive um, for districts to perhaps further segregate their schools. Um, you know, to create a financial incentive to, you know, create or draw boundaries in ways that 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 allow for, you know, greater concentration of need. I think from a, just a technical kind of school finance perspective, um, that's definitely, you know, a concern. You don't want to create financial incentives to do, you know, to kind of group students in, in ways that, that maximize dollars, um, but perhaps go against some of the other benefits um, that we think we get, you know, from more integrated schools, uh, both socioeconomically and racially. So the next question of all the, the levers in the formula from the base to the supplemental um, and you know, the concentration, is there one, you know, if I had to change one, um, what would I change to increase targeting and how? Um, and, you know, I think this is a, is a tricky question. I think in the world where we have a lot of additional funding, um, you know, I think there, it, it, say we have, you know, we have an economy that continues to boom and we have better budgets over the next few years. Um, it might make sense to, you know, increase the base grant, have that flow through additional supplemental and concentration dollars for these other districts, um, and increasing the base may, you know, reflect uh, the realities that costs have increased for a lot of districts, and then allow those supplemental and concentration dollars to truly be supplemental dollars that help high need districts. Um, that may not be the reality going forward. You know, I think some of these districts in the middle, uh, you know, that are kind of moderately in concentration don't get a lot of additional funds. You know, recently we've increased the amount the, of the concentration grant, um, but increasing the supplemental grant might actually make sense to try to smooth some of that out. Um, so it's not such a large difference between the high need students that are in, you know, an 80 or 90 percent high need district and those that are in a 60 or 70 because there's a big financial district, you know, difference in those districts now. Um, we have a question from, from Mary Briggs at CSBA. Um, do we have any recommendations for increasing transparency in LCAPs while also addressing the need for streamlining plans? Um, and I think this is a key, you know, this is a key question. Uh, and I kind of hand waved over this in the presentation. I think my thoughts, you know, on this are that, you know, I think from a fiscal perspective, if, if LCAPs, if LCAPs indeed are an accountability tool, um, for, you know, the fiscal planning and for how districts are spending supplemental and concentration dollars, um, then I think that there's, there ought to be a way to link that with the regular reporting that districts are doing, um, both under the SAC system, um, but then also the federal reporting that they do at the site level. And so kind of linking these different financial reports uh, in ways, so it's not just financially reporting, you know, for the state, for the federal government, for the LCAP, and they're not linked and they're not consistent. I think, you know, linking those across um, could really help streamline the financial side of it. Um, and then, you know, putting this as, as not just an online template, but truly an online document um, could, could perhaps, you know, allow uh, for better, you know, ability for stakeholders to really kind of piece out the information and pull out the information they need rather than having to parse through the relevant sections. Um, but again, I think that, you know, the devil's in the details there. Um, and I am wary of adding a lot of additional work to districts uh, to kind of, you know, I think there have been a lot of changes to LCAPs and the LCAP templates. Um, so it's definitely a concern, you know, how can we best kind of get better financial uh, and fiscal transparency um, without creating new burdens for districts when we've already added so many. Um, but, you know, so I think that's definitely a concern. Uh, but, you know, how these dollars are targeted ultimately kind of mediate the resources that we have to affect achievement gaps. So it's an incredibly, you know, important question to kind of get this right to make sure we're spending you know, in the ways that kind of maximize the impact we have and maximize, uh, you know, the equity of spending that we have. A question from uh, Dr. Kirst, uh, 
at Stanford. Um, so the yeah, salary increases may be essential to attract good teachers. How can we address this? Um, and I think you know that's this is kind of a key financial question. Often we're we're looking at dollars um, as they're you know spent district wide or perhaps by sites, but really what are what you know schools are are spending on are, are staffing um, and and in particular spending on good teachers. And so you know I think to the extent that we have additional funding to go in the system to really kind of in, increase our ability to attract more you know kind of better teachers and retain better you know retain high quality teachers. Um, I think that's, you know, that's always kind of a solution that's put out there, but it, it is, you know, it is one of the solutions. Um, I think other, you know, other ways uh, to kind of make sure that, that the teaching force is, is, you know, not just kind of is well prepared, uh, you know, are also key. Um, one thing I'll note there that this is kind of, you know, I think that isn't a, a talked about as much, but is an important consideration when it comes to, to salary um, and also just spending on teachers. Um, that has come out of some of our work on LCFF is that, you know, we know and we find that a lot of low income districts or low income schools within districts tend to actually spend more um, on staffing, um, but they they spend more uh, through often higher numbers of staff. So smaller class sizes or smaller, you know, pupil staff ratios um, and and have less experienced staff and higher retention rates. And so I think that's also something that needs to be addressed. Kind of, you could have equal or even progressively spent dollars under LCFF, um, but if those districts are just spending more to kind of and you know have trouble retaining staff, um, that you know that creates an additional burden and that may not have the intended impacts on students. So I think, you know, so kind of the, the funding under the formula is really key to kind of address the first part of, of you know allowing districts to have the ability to hire more staff and to hire better experienced staff. Uh, but I don't think we've gotten to a point where, you know, we've solved some of these retention issues and indeed, you know, post pandemic um, for reasons unrelated just to the financing, but it's certainly gotten a little bit worse as well. And then the final question um, from uh, Romel Antoine from Fortune School of Education, um, does data exist on student group performance over the past 10 years of LCFF? Um, and so we do we do have data on this. And so, um, you know, we have some of this in a report. Uh, and we have more of this actually in our report from 2021, looking at just performance of different student groups, both student groups overall and then dis uh, districts of different characteristics. Um, and we have this back to the first year of LCFF, um, or at least the first year of the SBAC testing. So really 2014, um, not the first year uh, of LCFF. So we do have you know uh, data on some of these trends. I think the high level trends that I'll just kind of point out pre-pandemic, we did see some movement. Um, some reduction in gaps, uh, you know, by income. Uh, they were larger when you compare it, you know, to the, you know, comparing very high need to lower need districts, rather than if we just say compare high need to low need students. But we saw movement on both. Um, and then a lot of that progress that we saw in the first several years of LCFF has unfortunately, you know, been, in, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of erased when it comes to, you know, comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen declining scores both overall um, and increases in gaps. So I think that's you know something that's been concerning on, on these trends um, and is you know should kind of devote is is really where we want to devote the the majority of our efforts going forward. Um, how can we kind of get back to that place where we're you know in, in reducing these gaps rather than you know especially back to the levels that they were before and hopefully much better than that. Um, so I'll ask one more question uh, or I'll answer one more question. This is from Ellen San Francisco. Was special education student achievement considered in this study? Um, and the answer to that is. Uh, those special education students who took the primary exam, um, uh, the primary SBAC exams were included in the sample, um, but those who took, uh, you know, alternate exams or didn't take the exams uh, were not, you know, didn't take the, the main SBAC exams were not included in the study. Um, and it's something, you know, special education uh, achievement as well as special education finance um, is, is, you know, on a separate mechanism from LCFF. Um, definitely a real cost pressure, definitely a real, you know, challenge for districts, both from, you know, both for students who experience these needs and, and as well as districts uh, trying to kind of navigate and provide for these students. Um, and it's something that, you know, we've done some work on uh, at PPSA in the past, but, uh, you know, hasn't been as much of, of an attention, but probably should, you know, be more of a focus going forward. So I appreciate the question. And it looks like we just have maybe like 30 seconds or a minute left. Um, so I'll just kind of leave it at that. I don't know. I don't think we have time for another question. Um, but again, I just want to thank you know everyone for 
tuning into the webinar. Um, again, thank our funders uh, for you know providing the, the conditions to allow us to do this work. Um, and I'll just kind of encourage anyone who has questions either about the presentation um, or the report to please reach out. Uh, you know, my email is is my last name, LaFortune at ppic.org. So, you know, happy to continue a dialogue on, on any of these questions. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.